so kick, kicking things off, uh, we have Joe Kim and uh, Lee Sullivan. Uh, they are the best of breed winners for Mini Rex for the last two years of the ARBA conventions. Um, and both the uh, breeders that uh, have been extremely successful uh, for a number of years. Um, so it's really exciting to have both of you guys on, t on tonight. Thank you guys. Thanks for having us, David. Glad yeah. to be here. Thank you. Or the, the goal of this presentation is uh, breeding for the correct top line. And that's one of the things that I've seen that's most fascinating about your guys' breeding programs and why I feel that uh, why you guys have won Best of Breed Mini Rex for the last two years is that somehow you've figured out a way of moving that high point back and consistently having rabbits that just have extreme depth of body and, ex and, and excellent type. Um, so to kick things off, what is proper top line? Okay, uh... First of all, top line, you know, Elisa wanted to reiterate this, that, you know, on the profile or the side view of the rabbit, uh, it can be broken down into um, three parts. You've got the shoulder. Um, everybody knows where the shoulder is. And there's also the midsection. The midsection is between the uh, shoulder and the hindquarter. It includes part of the loin, but the thing is, is it doesn't include the hind quarter, which is from uh, the high point all the way down to the hips. So we have to evaluate all three sections and know what the shape of that top line needs to look like on the shoulder, on the midsection, and on the hind quarter in order to get correct bodies on all breeds, actually. And David, I got to tell you, having raised um, you know many different breeds. There are a lot of similarities, um, you know, especially in the hind quarter, the shape of the hind quarter between a mini Rex, a Californian, um, a tan, for example, or even a Netherland dwarf or a uh, hollow knot. The shape of that turn over the hip should be as round and short as possible without giving the appearance of being chopped or, or, or undercut. Uh, so starting with the shoulder, everybody wants a deep shoulder, but I think um, a lot of people mistake uh, the shoulder with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the midsection. The midsection is, uh, when, it's a great diagram that we're looking at over there. Um, you know, the, the rabbit on the left has a lot of depth over the, uh, over the hip, um, the rabbit on the right you know, peaks a little forward. It's a, you know, it's not that bad of a rabbit, but David, um, as a judge, if you look at those rabbits, you can see the length of that loin from the front of that loin to that back of that loin, right? So if you're, if you start to shorten that hind quarter, what'll happen is, is that high point will actually move further, further back. Um, and you got to understand Roundness of loin is paramount here, and you got to understand the shape of the loin on the front half of that loin, and also the shape of that loin on the back half of that loin too. The uh, the you know the rise on a mini rex is described as a a gradual curve. What it doesn't describe is at what angle should that rise actually rise out of the neck and lead to that high point. The more, the flatter to rise, you're gonna get a longer rabbit and the steeper to rise, you're gonna get a shorter rabbit. And Elise and I both raised mini Rex as well as you actually. And what we want is a shorter rabbit. So in order to get that shorter rabbit, we wanna have a rise from the neck to the high point that is steeper. And um, the shape of that rise is it's crucial on getting that high point. The area in front of that high point, um, you don't want that rise to have too much curve. It, it asks for a gradual curve. So the traditional, um, the incorrect way of doing it is to look at a rabbit that's half of a basketball. If you split half of a basketball to the front half and the back half, they're identical. So the rise is identical to the turnover the hip on that rabbit. And if you make those two shapes identical, 
the rabbit will literally peek right in the middle of the back. And that's not correct. So how do you actually move the high point further back? What you want to do is you want to take that rise from the neck over that rib cage to be as on a mini Rex right now to be as straight and steep as possible. And you want that gradual curve to start at the front of the loin until you get to that high point. That's where the gradual curve is. And when you read the uh, standard, it talks about the hind quarter should round, you, you, the, uh, the, the uh, top line should round over the hind quarter. So when you're actually rounding over the hind quarter, you're turning over the hip. So the way I like to idealize the shape of that, um, that turn is if you look, if you go from the high point to the, uh, to the, uh, to the end of the loin, it should be shaped like a quarter of a, uh, a circle. And that's what gives you the proper turn shape. And that is what puts the high point in the right place. So when you're, and, and that's what I think is so fascinating about your guys, is, is that um, for so long, like the rabbit on the right-hand side, so right. many ring arcs because we bred them to be so short in overall body length that right. it's just get them as extreme deep as we can, get them as short coupled as we can. And as a result of that, it's turned into more of this style where it's just a half a basketball and we haven't really cared about high. That's what I find so fascinating about your guys. It's, okay. So look, that, look at I, that. Okay. Go on. Sorry. It, no, is that, is that you guys have been able to uh, properly make them where they have an actual like rise in their shoulder, a rise in their midsection, hit a high point and then turn. Right. Um, we, we, we want to take that rise deeper and we want to make that loin deeper and rounder and that roundness of loin, especially on the back half of that loin, will put that high point further back and maximize depth over the hind quarter. So when you, so to do that, what, I mean, what's the magic formula to actually achieve? That? I mean, how, how do you get rabbits to do that? Okay, so, um, you know, I got mini Rex first in uh, the beginning of 2019. And I think the first thing I looked at is I looked, at, I read the standard over and I looked at the rabbits. I looked at a lot of different people's rabbits. And I said, what is the prevailing fault here that, that I could capitalize on and, and, you know, make some adjustments in order to make the rabbit more correct and better? I wanted to deepen it. I wanted to move the high point further back. I wanted to put more fullness into that, into the uh, into that loin and also that lower hind quarter. And in order to achieve that, I went around. I went around it, you know, using uh, what I knew what I knew best, raising other breeds, whether it be tans or uh, even Californians. I started taking keeping rabbits that were longer not good show rabbits. They were longer in body. The uh, rise wasn't as steep, but it was more gradual, but it moved the high point further back. And I took rabbits like that and bred it to like the rabbit on that right, on the, the right on the image. And the rabbit on the right will actually shorten the uh, front half of the rabbit, yet the longer does that I kept that peaked further back actually uh, contributed to the integrity of that high point and, you know, added more depth over the hind quarter. That's how I did it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And for me, my story is a little bit different. I mean, like you said, David, we were all kind of breeding for that deep basketball. And I would have to admit, I didn't know any better. And that's kind of what I was focusing on. I was crazy about depth. So at least I had that depth aspect down. And then before Joe and I became friends, we probably started talking 2020. That's when things really started to turn around. I was watching Joe's posts. Um, he became my mentor very quickly. And that's how I really was able to incorporate my herd, not even with Joe's genetics, but everything he's taught me, like he's been saying, um, that's really been able to change my herd a lot and focusing, breaking down shoulder, midsection and hind quarter. And the roundness of loin is one of the most important things in my opinion, and really sets up that turn in that top line. As we're talking about top line, that's one of the biggest things too. So. I, I agree with that. Uh, well, I, mean, I I agree with the part that Elise, I think when Elise and I first became friends, 
he's raised mini racks a lot longer than me. And, you know, it's just the way that the mini racks were out there. Most of them look <laughs> like that on the right. Uh, when you keep breeding rabbits look, that look like the rabbit on the right, the loin gets longer. The rabbits yes. may stay short, but they start to lose depth. And, you know, in order to, in, when you look to see how do you achieve depth, the depth is, start, it starts at the rise. It starts at the shoulder in the midsection. You need a steeper rise in order to get that depth. <laughs> and if you continue, the, the more rise you get, the deeper that rabbit gets. Mm -hmm. So both Elise and I have been breeding for more rise. We're getting a shorter turn over the hip and we're putting uh, the high point over the hip versus over the middle of the back. So I think Elise and I can agree with this. Um, you know, we've talked about this many times. We talk about this too many times. <laughs> we obsess over this. Yeah. But, Phone calls every day. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but um, if you look at uh, where that high point actually is, you know, there's a lot of discrepancy um, in, the, in the glossary and the standard. It talks about that the high point should be at the center of the hip. Well, where exactly is center of that hip? You know, people look at it. The hip is actually a joint and it's located all the way at the back. And, uh, and if, 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 if you went by the anatomical physiological description the rabbit would look like a 45 degree like a like a 45 degree wedge you know literally peaking all the way at the back and chopping all the way down to the bottom well we figured out that wasn't correct um so we looked at the the traditional definition of what the uh hip is you know we talk about an angular hip a hip that's you know you know a hip that lacks fullness um, you know, hip, we talk about gaps between the loin and the hip. Well, this traditional idea of what a hip is, is actually part of the uh, rear leg, actually. It's the muscle, the muscle part on the side of that rear leg from the, where the, where, you know, it includes the front of the stifle to the back of that rabbit. If you take the front of that uh, stifle and the back of the rabbit, and you draw a straight line and you draw a center point between the front of the stifle and the back of the rabbit and you extend it per per perpendicular straight up, that would be the center of the hip as by traditional terms. But, you know, we know that getting that high point in the exact same spot is pretty much impossible for anybody. I mean, a good high point is a high point anywhere behind that front of that stifle to the uh, the center of that hip. Those are pretty good uh, high points. Anything behind that center of the hip to the uh, back of the hip, the rabbit starts looking chopped. That turn becomes a little bit too extreme. You start getting, you know, uh, you start getting taper in the loin. You start getting rabbits that are pinched in the lower hind quarter. So it's this whole thing about achieving a fine balance of having the depth and the correct high point and yet still being able to fill out that loin as well as filling out that lower hind quarter. And well, and that's what I think is, is so fascinating is that, uh, you know, if you get that profile correct, the other, when you look at it from above or you look at the rabbit from behind, it turns out that those views end up being correct as well because it, it gives you the width of loin that you need, the power of loin, the power of the lower hind quarter, like all of it just, the bone structure just falls into place is my opinion. Is, do you guys agree? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, Elise and I talk about this too. A lot of people look at the rear view of the rabbit and they have an incorrect um, ideal in their own heads of what the rear of that rabbit should look like. You know, they, they, like a, they like a rabbit that's like literally half of a basketball from behind. But when you, you know, when you actually look at that, think about it. A half of a basketball from the rear view is twice as wide as it is deep. So that <laughs> is because you have to live by what the standard says, where depth equals width. And mm -hmm. when you look at the rear of that rabbit, it should look more like an upside down U versus yep. 
basketball. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it should look like half, like an upside down U is you want to have that loin coverage, the width of loin to smoothly trans transition into the side of the hips and then start to, you know, round out to the base. So, mm -hmm. so all views are really important. The top view where you show, where you look to, to see how much taper the rabbit has, the mm -hmm. rear view to see how much roundness and width of loin that the rabbit actually has and the width of the hindquarter base. And then also, you know, what everybody's interested in when they're, you know, looking at rabbit pictures is they're looking at the profile, which is the top line. Mm -hmm. And like, I think a good point to, thing to point out as well too, Joe always says is the widest part of the rabbit should be the deepest. So like that high point. So you can of course look at it from the side, but you can also find that high point from the top as well. Absolutely. Elise is hundred percent correct. The deepest part of the rabbit will always be the widest part of that rabbit, regardless of where it peaks. So if you're not sure about the top line, just look at the rabbit from above. That deepest part of that rabbit is where the high point should be. And if you have a basketball, it'll be right in the middle of the back. If you have a rabbit that peaks correctly, you'll have taper and you'll have, uh, you'll have the widest part at the uh, hind quarter versus the uh, middle of the rabbit. Mm. Mm -hmm. and at least Great point, and that's what makes your guys' rabbit so powerful is, is by having the right type, it gives them the muscle, it gives them the shape that they need to, to be full. Correct. Mm -hmm. There's definitely a lot of working parts. Everything is literally connected. So it really is. And uh, you know, there's uh there's pitfalls to um, you know, breeding deeper rabbits that peak further back too. You're going to see a lot of fault. I mean, this is what makes this um, such a challenge and such a beautiful hobby is that when you get a rabbit that, you know, starts deep at the shoulder, a deeper midsection, and even a deeper hip and a perfect turnaround to hip. Rabbits like that, they want to be longer in the shoulder. They want yep. to be narrower in the base. Yes, yes greater tendency to have a uh, taper in the loin. And that's why making a great rabbit is so difficult mm -hmm. and so challenging. And that's why we love it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing too. A lot of people just expect to have that perfect rabbit, but you really have to have all those working parts. You're not going to have a bunch of rabbits with perfect top lines, perfect bodies. You have to have a little bit of everything. And finally that puzzle is going to come together for that one rabbit. And who knows if that rabbit will even produce, but that's, that's like Joe said, the biggest challenge of it and what makes it really fun and interesting. So you're saying that you have rabbits that have, have the parts that you're putting together to make the special ones. Mm -hmm. um, those ones still should produce well, and but sometimes they don't necessarily match themselves. So you have to be able to keep those parts to know what you're doing and be able to keep creating mm -hmm. the most great shape. <laughs> And that's why it's so important to understand that structure, being able to break down each part of the rabbit um, and pairing them together and thinking generations and generations ahead. You have to set those goals years ahead. Otherwise, what are you doing then? You really, you really have to think about what your end goal is on body. That's correct. So you guys aren't looking at it as I'm just trying to cross this rabbit, this buck and this doe. You, you guys are looking at it as a multi-generational thing to get where you want to be. Yes. Each, each rabbit, each brood stock animal that you have is going to have its breeding tendencies. Some will want to breed, you know, and they're going to have tendencies in terms of not only their attributes, but also their faults. Mm -hmm. So the consistent qualities that each of those rabbits, you know, produce usually takes me about two litters to figure out the... Yeah. Uh, the, produ the productive you know, ability of a rabbit. And our job as breeders are no different than an artist. We're trying to match together, breed together, combine you know, and match rabbits that produce these attributes that are actually you know, difficult to achieve and that are correct. I wanna add too, I think one of the biggest things for me when I'm deciding who I want to breed together I'm looking at the litters they produced. I'm looking at how, what consistently those traits they produce, like Joe said, and it's 
I'm, I'm almost looking more at the babies they've already produced before um, to see how they can produce with another rabbit, if that makes sense. Yep. Agreed. And, and so you guys are looking at, hey, this one has a tendency of producing this part or this, uh, this trait, yeah. and you're, then you cross it with other does to see what it ends up throwing, if that still ends up staying true or if the does end up making an effect on it. Yeah, no, and I think that that's, I think that's the hard puzzle of uh, being an artist like Joe said, or, you know, as a, as a rabbit breeder is understanding that those traits is what really matters to make yes. the next generation awesome or a couple generations down the road awesome. Correct. It's not just necessarily that one rabbit, I think, is a lot of people just look at that one rabbit, what it looks like, but how it produces is the most important. That's right. I have a, I mean, Elise knows my rabbits just as well as I do. She's seen every one of them. Uh, you know, I have a buck with a phenomenal top line. Um, he looks like a doe, but a really good doe. Super tall. His name is Haha ha Dead. Elise named him. Uh, but uh, we always thought he was a doe until he was DQ'd at convention for being a, a senior buck. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I, I mean, I didn't even have to flip him over. I thought it was a doe, but it was super deep, a broken buck. And you know, I got to tell you, um, uh, I bred with him and Elisa's bred with him is great of a top line. He has, he does not want to throw that top line as much as, you know, you know, something that looks like him. Mm -hmm. I have a buck that peaks a little bit more forward, fuller in the loin, but, um, and Elise knows who I'm talking about once again, and he's mm -hmm. still throwing rounder and better mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. the head. And better top lines than this and rabbit. He's consistent, in my opinion, too. Dad's it's kind of haha. Dad's kind of a wild card, but Dee Dee is it, probably the best herd buck in the country, and he really just produces consistent animals, especially does that just have incredible top lines that Joe's been able to for generations now has been able to incorporate into his. Well, I mean, uh, Elise, let's take that back. I had a little bit of a stigma. I've been complaining to you that he peeks a little bit forward. I didn't want to use them that much. What are we taking I, back? On 13 does. And the thing is, is like, based on the limited number of those 13 litters, there's some pretty darn nice rabbits inside of there. And then I just started figuring out, I mean, I figured this out before, but the best rabbits are not necessarily the best producers. And that is the, you know, the- Exactly. The that we have to figure out. That's the truest thing. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. And that's why I think it's also important to keep sisters. I think sisters are so important. Your best sister, the best showing one, she might not be the best producer. Her yeah. uglier sister might be. And I've, I've had experience with that as well, too. And that I think has a lot of the genotype side of things as well, too. That's right. So how do you, like, how do you keep track of it? Like, do you guys just keep track of it in your head? Do you guys write it down? Like, what do you do to, to know what traits the rabbit throws? We talk so. about it every day. <laughs> um, I mean, I definitely keep it in my head. Um, I, I mean, okay, let me give you our schedule. <laughs> I mean, like, 5 and 7 o'clock in the morning, okay? And uh, I'm... Looking at rabbits where it's, you know, when it's still not even sunlight out, I, I want to, I'm most focused in the morning. The rabbits had, you know, uh, you know, they've been, they ate the day because I, during the winter, I feed in the morning. Uh, but uh, the rabbits basically are on an empty stomach. I get a really good look at what they look like. They're not all pot bellied from being full, especially the younger rabbits. They look very distorted when they're on a full stomach. So I like to look at them on an empty stomach. Elisa's schedule, I mean, I know her schedule too. Her <laughs> bed in the morning, like mine are, but the thing is, is her free time is in the evening. So she gets back from work, has dinner with her family, and then she's out in the barn. And I start getting rabbit pictures starting at <laughs> around, around like five o'clock, four, four or five o'clock. So we look at our rabbits, you know, 12 hours apart, but we're consistent of on you know when we look at them and when we evaluate them you don't want to like sit there and evaluate rabbits three or four hours after they ate they, they don't ever the difference why, why is, is astronomical the difference is astronomical but, 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 but why 
they're, they're all potty and they feel, mm -hmm. they feel potty, loose and flat. They feel they look longer. Longer flat. is the biggest thing. Longer and flatter, in my opinion. They yeah. the pot belly, which causes them to they expand, and then everything else expands with them. So longer and flatter, and they'll never look good in pictures. Yeah, on on show day, David, I take away, I take away all water feet. and feet. Take away the water, everything. I don't want them to have any water or food the day that they're being shown. Mm -hmm. They never Rabbit. they never get fed until right when they're done showing. Right. Just so that they have the ability to have the, the, the feeds not stretching them out or making them look longer. Yeah, exactly. And it's not even so much them going overweight. Sometimes that can be the case, um, but it's because it distorts how they look. That's right. Absolutely. Especially the younger the rabbit, the more distorted it'll look after on a full mm -hmm. step. Yes. Younger, especially age. Yeah. Um, no, and I think that that's something that's really crucial. Or I mean, that's something that not everybody understands or sees. I mean, if you're not handling your rabbits you know, at multiple different times a day, that's a, you know, a secret that not everybody knows for sure mm -hmm. uh, that it affects their top line and affects the way they look and, and, and feel. Um, okay. I, we don't, at least, in, at least and I, I think, you know, part of our goals is um, we don't want to keep secrets. You know, we want, we want everyone to know what our goals are. Uh, we share on our Facebook pages, on our, you know, rabbit, rabbitry groups. We'll post pictures of rabbits. We'll say what we like about it, what we like about the body and, you know, what we're basically uh, reading for. Uh, you know, I think, um, the part of social media that's made it uh, really nice is it makes it accessible for other people to see different styles of bodies. And you get to see the style of bodies that are winning and you get to see the style of bodies that are, you know, not winning. It's not like, it's not that Elise and I have been changing the body style on our rabbits. We're just trying to make them more correct. Right. You know, we want a deeper, shorter rabbit. And I think a lot of people, when they, when they talk about shortness, they don't, they, they look at shortness and they said, well, what is exactly, what exactly is shortness? Shortness to me is, you know, obviously you don't want a long shoulder. You don't want to, uh, basically you want a short midsection on a, on a, um, on a, on a mini Rex. But if you take that, a draw a horizontal line between the front of the loin and the back of that rabbit, that, that line should be as short as possible. And the way to shorten that hind quarter is to make the rise steeper right. and rise steeper and straighter over the, uh, over the rib cage and a gradual curve starting at the loin. And you want that turn over the hip to be short without being chopped. You don't want any angles in that loin. Mm -hmm. And that's you the just, basic. I think most, most mini wrecks, they, they have curve in their spine, that straightness. They might have a, like a deep shoulder and a deeper spine, making them deeper, of course, everywhere, but they're more curved in their spine and they look more like that deep basketball. So being able to pinpoint what a curved spine looks like versus a straight spine is important um, for people to really look at right away if they're trying to improve their top line. That's right. So the best definition for a gradual rise is a line that basically starts straight at the, uh, at the starting at the neck over that rib cage, that line should be straight and that gradual curve should start at the beginning of the loin and continue to continue mm -hmm. to curve until you get to the high point. Mm -hmm. When you put too much roundness, you know, you have a rise that goes like this. If you put too much roundness in the front half of that rabbit, look, look what it does. It lengthens out that loin and it makes that loin much longer and you don't get that you're not able to shoot that high point over the head. Mm. They're going to have a, what would make most sense to people is having a more of a flat spot over their loin. So That's cause them to peak early and slope off, so to say. Which then causes, comes with its own set of problems of. Right, uh, exactly. So more of, that curved that spine, right, more of that curved spine will cause them to peak in the middle of the back, slope off and have that flat spot over the loin. Right. They might still feel wide and they might still feel deep, but their top line is. In completely incorrect. So, so I'm slightly changing the angle on this, but I'm curious because 
like at least I'm, I know judging your rabbits at Wisconsin State Convention. Yeah. And I know those rabbits, some those same rabbits went on to win, you know, groups <laughs> at convention. The I, I, just remember, <laughs> I just remember like going through and being like, holy cow, like this Torp Buck, oh my God, he's absolutely yeah. incredible. Oh my gosh, like this black's absolutely amazing. Oh my gosh, this otter is absolutely amazing. That was literally amazing. all of them. Yeah, the black. And then, oh my God, the the, the, and then we get to the broken and just like, wow, her coat, her body, everything. Oh my gosh. And she wins three best in shows and best of the best. And then she won a convention. Like how, how are you able to be competitive in that many different colors? Like, are they all compatible? Like, what do you yeah. do? That's a good question. Um, all, so I really focus on black, broken, otter, tort. Those are my four main colors. I have blues and whites every once in a while, but my black brokens and otters all go together. Um, so they're everything, everything's bred together. And that's why I think those three colors can be successful together. The torts have been my baby since I started raising rabbits when I was probably about eight years old. Um, and I just have kind of bred them together forever. And I never brought in any colors. They're all tort to broken tort breedings. And um, so that's kind of fun. I, I've, none of the genetics are related at all between the blacks, even in the torts. So um, really being able to learn and breeding the rabbits together based on their traits, like we've been saying, I've been able to make them deep, make them have a round, like that roundness in the loin and a good top line. So it didn't necessarily have to do with genetics relating, but really understanding the structure of them and how I can make them better because they're so completely different than my other colors, <laughs> but they're starting to look similar now. <laughs> No, and I think that's, I think that's what's fascinating. Like as a judge, like getting to have my hands on those rabbits, I feel that like, it's, it's like, it's a, a factory or a machine and you're just like stamping out another one. That's a replica and another one. That's always the goal. One. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, I mean, it's, 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 uh, you appreciate it, you know, getting uh -huh. to have your hands on those kind of awesome feeling. Animals. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was, it was nice to have you judge. It's been, it's definitely been a while. So that was cool. And then being able to tell you about how they actually did two at conventions. So yeah, no, it was, it was fitting. I mean, it, it wasn't a surprise to me after getting my hands on those <laughs> ones. Um, I'm switching or I'm looking at some questions. Okay. This one's a broader one, but still in that same, you know, what we're focusing on. How many bucks and does do you guys feel like you need to have to be competitive within the respective colors or within, within the arrows? That's a good question. Yeah. Cause I just made a post about her books recently. So Joe and I can probably go on and on about this one. I'd say 10% uh, of your rabbits uh, produce 90% of your keepers. Mm -hmm. Maybe even 5% keep 90% of your keepers. You know who your you know who those star bird does and herd bucks are for sure. Yeah, you better know it. Um, I think the the most important thing to do for any breeder is not to think you are right. I always question myself. I have from the beginning, and you know I go to uh, great lengths at looking at uh, you know what my concept concept of ideal is and making sure that I'm correct on it. So I think. The biggest um, handicap that a breeder can have is saying that, no, I like this style versus that. Mm -hmm. Look at the other style and say, is this more correct than what I have? I want to look, compare it to the standard and I want to say, which, which style is more correct? Some people mm -hmm. saying like, well, I like this style. Well, you can like it all you want. It's not going to win. It's not going to be the correct style. That's the problem. So um, one of the biggest things that you have to do in breeding right an open mind, um, be adaptable to change. And you got to be able to adapt, you know, make minute changes in your, in your ideal in order to say, these are my breeding goals for this year. And these are the changes that I want to make to my rabbits. And you got to make sure that those are, you know, online on par with the, uh, the standard of perfection. Going back to the, um, like your herd bucks and brood does, um, knowing your herd and every an animal individually is so important because like Joe said, only a certain percent of them actually will produce your winners. And one of the biggest things I learned years ago was from Ryan Hara. And it's simply just thinking, 
okay, if you had to cut back on your herd right now, what like 10 animals would you keep for breeding? You, you should know exactly. You should not have to even think about it. Like that's something you should always think about and know what are your best, your best herd animals. That's right. I, I have a follow up question that I, I just can't think of. David, I think we're all guilty of it. I have probably like five or six bucks here, senior bucks here, and I probably have, I think I had 36 uh, brood does. And in reality, when I, when I really look at them, you know, I could probably cut them down to about, you know, six or eight brood does and maybe like two or three bucks. But the thing is, is like, we are curious human beings. We want to try certain crosses and mm -hmm. see what, because that can be, that can set the standard for the next generation. You might well, produce completely unexpected that is exceptionally good out of a certain cross mm -hmm. and makes us breeders and willing to experiment and try different things versus just using things that are reliable because we still want something better than what we have than our best animals. Right. right. Exactly. That's and yeah. And I, I think that's why if you can having as many holes as possible is so important because you never know how they're going to produce. And it's fun to have those wild cards like that. So that's why I really think it's important to keep a lot of herd bucks, but you should know what are your best ones. Um, like I talked about a little, we, me and Joe talk about a little bit too, with like a unicorn herd buck, like, Mine would be blacklist, but that took forever for me to get a, a, a unicorn herd buck. And I still want better than that. I, I've always had a herd buck where I think, wow, this is, this is my best herd buck. This is awesome. And I've come so far, like Zephyr is one of my old bucks and I still have him. I never use him, but he's the reason I have so many good ones, but like, there's so much still missing that I needed. And blacklist is the closest I have and DD and Mako and Joe's barn are two of the nicest bucks I've ever seen. And not only just because of the way they look, but the way they produce as well too. So I only really use about two to four bucks consistently, probably, I mean, and I say that with both my programs. So like three bucks for my blacks, otters and brokens, and maybe really one buck mostly for my torts. Yeah. Um, because obviously those are a little smaller. I, I have my favorites in uh, Elisa's barn and Elisa's <laughs> favorite in my barn. Yeah. I kind of <laughs> favorites are. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's great that we're competitors, yet uh, we want to win, but we're still very supportive of um, the direction <laughs> where we want our rabbits to go. And I think that's very important. I think, um, you know, finding the right friendships in this hobby is very important because, uh, first of all, you got to find, you know, friends that are capable and uh, like minded. Able not only yeah not only like-minded but be able to understand what you're what you're what you're aspiring to do because a lot of people just look at you and say uh i think you're kind of crazy well yeah I, I know i'm a little bit crazy but the thing is is i'm passionate about what i do and i found you know a friend in the lease who's just as crazy as i am about her rabbits and uh and it's a you know it's a it's a good, good uh friendship Definitely. I'm not going to lie. When Joe first started posting all over Facebook, I had no idea who this random man was who just all of a sudden got into mini Rex. And I was like, what is he doing? This looks so crazy and wrong. And I really, before I even started talking to Joe, I just kind of analyzed his post and understood them. I'm like, wow, I really like how this looks. Can I, can I do this myself? And, um, I really, I really worked on that for a while. And then Joe and I became really good friends and we've been able to talk every day and explain our goals and what we're going to do, how we're going to, how we're going to improve our herd. So it's been, it's been great. I think the friendship makes this, uh, yeah. you know, a lot mm -hmm. more. Yeah. If you don't have someone to talk to where they understand you and your goals and what you're trying to improve, then there, it's not really all that fun. Um, because there might be something you're missing. Like I sent a picture to Joe yesterday. And I was like, Oh my God, I love this rabbit. Like, isn't it nice? And Joe's like, uh, I don't know. Let's look at it this way. So, um, I mean, we can all get a little blind, but no, I, that's not ripping on you. I'm just saying it no, has I, someone that I, understands and can, a lot of daughter and I'm looking at it compared to, uh, the diva daughter you sent me a picture of. And mm -hmm. the diva daughter looks right. a lot, a exactly. Round. Oh, I totally agree. Yeah. But it's just being able to talk to someone. When you have those great producing rabbits, though, do you keep them and keep being prolific and keep uh, getting more and more babies out of them? Or do you move on to the next generation and just keep moving? Okay, here's what I do. Um, 
so you have certain crosses that you know will work and mm -hmm. uh, great rabbits. Those are, that's your bread and butter. You want to keep repeating those rabbits because you're making great rabbits out of them. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you have, um, when I have does that are old, they're, they're getting older or that are very valuable. I don't even let them raise their litter. I just yep, pull foster their, is so important. I foster off the babies, let other does raise them. And I'll probably, Sometimes I immediately rebreed those back. I, yeah. I literally three litters in three months with one doe. Uh, and I'll do that. It, the, the wear and tear on these does is from the actual, you know, nursing and having all the rabbits, you know, all the babies running around together. If you, if you just, just carrying the babies, it's not that much stress on them. So you'll, you'll prolong the uh, breeding life of the doe by fostering off her litters. So. Absolutely. Fostering is like, honestly part of the art of it all i mean that's it's not a secret i mean that's one of the biggest tips really to understand is knowing how to foster and being able to read the free breed those does back right away because they actually are in the most heat right after they have their babies a day or two after so they're, that's their thing i practice as well their natural oxytocin levels are at the highest um the day that they kill, and they are most receptive so i i can't think of any doe that i bread the day that they kindled that did not lift and you know conceive mm. i think that covers everything unless you guys have additional angles that you want to go about is there anything else you guys want to cover uh well we didn't cover fur but uh no i'm ready we can do it i mean yeah. we can i know i know we were talking about top line but i guess this can be a good mini rex presentation <laughs> uh yeah there's <laughs> You know, we got just as many points on fur as on uh, as on bodies on these rabbits. So, mm -hmm. literally an even split. We have to go, and you know, you can grow a rabbit out, beautiful body and everything, and all of a sudden it's got an average coat, and you're thinking like, mm -hmm. shit. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when it comes to culling, you know, you gotta you can wait five months, and all of a sudden this rabbit that you had so much hope for just turns out to be you know, mm -hmm. slightly above average, not a winner, put it that way, because of the fur. Uh, when I raise cans, for example, I can, eight weeks, I, I wean them, I call them, I can show them at 12 weeks, they're winning busts and shows. They prime out around 16 or 17 weeks. I can move through those generations really fast. Mini Rex, no. Mm -hmm. I'm, I don't generally breed them until they're about, you know, seven, eight months old, at least. Sometimes I wait until they're like 10 months old, you know, because... Mm -hmm. They have to go to a, um, a convention or a national, for example. So a lot more patience involved with, with this breed. And I do want to make one point about this breed. I think it's true of all, you know, low headset compact breeds, Florida White, Savannahs, um, Mini Satins, Mini Rex, they change a lot. And one of the biggest skills that you can develop is learning how to predict how yeah. each going to develop because I got to tell you I've had rabbits that peak right in the middle of the back you know they grow out and they start to peak you know much deeper over the hip and they become better but you got this is you, you know a lot of people give me a lot of grief they're like why are you looking at your eight week old rabbits why are you looking at your three month old rabbits they're going to look different in you know in a couple months well I, I know that but the thing is, is like, I don't want to feed all these freaking rabbits growing out. I want to know the which ones are going to go bad. And I want to know which ones still have potential. That's why if I'm out there for an hour and a half every day looking at rabbits, I'm trying to learn, develop my skills instead of just looking for yeah. a great. Rabbit. And I think that helps with learning your lines. And that is plural. It's not just your herd. You have to know the lines within your herd because each one will produce differently. And you can, that's the fun of it is connecting those lines and um, creating even better animals and building more and more lines. So visualizing more as lines, I think is really important. Because you're saying that they progress differently. So one line may end up looking a certain style and as it grows, it gets longer in its overall body look or it gets really thick fur at so many yeah. months. I yeah. think I, in many Rex, the most disappointing thing you can have is a rabbit that'll flatten out in that loin and just get long, you know, and that's a lot. 
not a lot of them do, but you, you kind of mm-hmm. kind of know which ones will do that after right. you get to know your lines, you know, pretty good. But the thing is, is, you know, you want to know which ones are going to maintain that roundness of loin because they're the ones, the ones that are roundest in the loin will always be the deepest rabbits at the end. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I, I think another cool point, which is a little random, but your broody rabbits are always going to almost look better than the showy size rabbits. Like when they're young, you're posing them. They're like, Oh my gosh, that is so deep. Amazing top line. They grow up and I'm, I'm growing them up for months and they change. They don't, they don't look as good as they did before. And the show rabbits have caught up and they look a million times better. So that's another interesting point too. Okay. When Elisa is broody, I had no idea what broody meant. <laughs> Sorry. Broody. I know some people are like, Oh, a broody, broody chicken. I'm like, no. So like non-dwarf. Um, so they don't have the dwarf gene is what I mean. I, I understood. I mean, yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. Do, okay. So looking at fur though, directly on mini yeah. what does <laughs> I ideal fur look like and how does it feel? Oh gosh. I try to, I try to stick to the standard. I, you know, at least I used to use that word buttery. I think yeah. a lot, I think that buttery to me is referring to the evenness of coat. Um, evenness is uh, in the, um, in the standard of perfection. I like the springiness, um, it, the springiness, the combination of the density and correct texture is yes. what give you that spring and it gives you resistance, you know, mm-hmm. when you and back and forth from the, from the front, if you get a dense coat that's soft, there's no resistance. It kind of, the fur kind of like falls forward and it doesn't kind of spring back. Mm-hmm. So that springiness and that, you know, the, the butteriness or the evenness of that coat, I think that's what makes it, you know, really, really great. Um, you know, my goals for fur have changed from start to end. I do, I always wanted to say like, okay, coat, you know, the coat length, um, the, the, the minimum and the maximum lengths are five eighths to seven eighths of an inch. And then when I look at it, I, I literally want to breed the shortest, densest coat possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you want to learn, I mean, Joe and I could go on and on about fur density texture, but if you want to learn fur, Kathy Shoulder is one of the very best when it comes to understanding density and especially texture. Um, she can break down each hair and explain it to you and the, the thickness of the guard hair and how that affects the coat in general and how thin the undercoat is or how, I mean, how long it is compared to the guard hairs as well too. So being able to understand that is one of the biggest things. And for me personally, I have always focused a lot on that buttery texture, that really smooth feel, but being able to understand how to breed those together is really important too. So if you keep breeding beautiful buttery texture together and together, you're going to start getting soft coats. They're going to feel a little bit more cottony. Um, but that's why it's important to kind of have a little bit of guard hair, not a ton, of course, but to be able to breed in some of those denser, um, thicker guard hair bucks, um, with those, those buttery does. I think that's worked well for me. I, let me, let me elaborate on what yeah. Elisa Please. I, I agree with that part, but when it when she's talking about the guard hair, she's not talking about long guard hair. Yeah. She's talking about a thicker thick, diameter. Thick, yes. Hair. So it's got mm-hmm. you know more to it. Some people might call it slightly coarse. Yeah. I kind of feeling on a buck, you know. I think those are yeah. the ones that are best sex. And the reason rabbits feel so soft in their coat, if it's not buttery, it's because they don't have thicker guard hair. That's right. And you know correct texture you you don't even have to feel it you can actually see it the ones with the right. good texture they grow. have a very great polished look to them mm-hmm. they actually reflect light instead of absorb light and they don't have a dull finish they have a very polished finish with you know a lot of glow to it mm. exactly and, and i think that the, uh i think that's one of the things that's the hardest about rabbits though is that you know the great ones don't necessarily always produce great or you can't just read great together to great together to great together and keep getting great right. is that you have to have those uh that unique trait to still put in there to get the next generation of great ones and that's one of the biggest mistakes breeders will make will just be breeding good rabbits to good rabbits to good rabbits but yeah like you said you have to have those unique extreme traits to be able to produce more extreme traits 
that are consistent. One of the things I learned early on many, many years ago is do not fall in love with your winners. Uh Because you know what? It might have had its one day of glory and it'll never produce anything as nearly as good as it. So I never fall in love with the winners. I look at, I fall in love with the best producing rabbits. That's the most important backbone to your herd. Uh, Absolutely. A lot of people actually call, they go, they go out to rabbit shows. They, 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 they figure out which ones are winning and they breed the winners to winners. Usually like, you know, they can get good to great results out of it. Um, not as consistent as somebody who is looking at traits, breaking it down and trying to offset fault, offset faults and under somebody who understands the breeding um, potential of each of their uh, animals. Those are the people that are going to be more consistent. Mm. Absolutely. I, for me personally, um, I attend more shows than Joe outside of nationals convention. And I'll be honest, I don't, I don't always listen to the judge's opinion. I'm excited to see what they pick for breed and opposite, but I, I know my opinion and, but it is also important and interesting to also see what that judge thinks too. Like you can learn something small or big, um, about your breed just simply by doing that, but you need to know your animals. Um, never go to a show and just base your placements off of that rabbit. It may be because they were unfinished out of condition. If you fed it better, you groomed it better. It probably could have done better. Um, and don't call for that reason, just based on how that rabbit places. I mean, I've had some underrated rabbits that I know were, were special to me and I wanted to put in my breeding program, tried showing them. Maybe the judge doesn't like them, but I know personally that I Think that rabbit will help my herd so i will use it for breeding even if it doesn't have a win under its belt yeah for example my best herd buck is missing a toe <laughs> dd i think uh other either yeah it was born or else when i pulled out one of the pans it, it ripped his toe out or something but he doesn't have a toe but you know he's still my one of my most important rabbits here. So I want to keep them, I keep them alive and healthy. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. It, it doesn't have to, the winds, the winds don't produce great rabbits. This the genetics each one of those animals have and the traits they can produce. Right. I mean, yeah. winning, of course, winning is always fun, but uh, I, with my show team, I already know what one I, I want to win that I think will win. So um, being able to know that yourself too, just not based on how that rabbit's been doing is really important. This is just an everyday conversation for me and Joe, honestly. <laughs> talk about this crap every day. <laughs> Literally every day, David. But no, this yeah. is awesome. I, I, and that's what makes it interesting and fun, though, right? I mean, like, because having those connections and having people that understand how traits work, um, it's a different level than what, you know, a, a person that's just randomly hoping breeding two rabbits together and not knowing what they're going to produce. You know, you guys have a plan, you know, likely what the outcome is going to be because of knowing the past of the animals and, and what they right. have already. Spent. Joe, do you want to talk a little bit about um, like how bone and like density correlate? That's right. Yeah. So uh, one thing, um, one thing to keep in mind is rabbits uh, that have uh, better bone will tend to have better density, but you know, with that comes a downside too. Rabbits with better bone also tend to have, tend to be softer in flesh. The uh, only person who, uh, who skirted, you know, who, who proved everybody wrong is uh, when Bob Crawford has had his uh, New Zealand's, he had, you know, those New Zealand bucks that were massive bone, but they were super hard in flesh. And, you know, I can attest to that because he sent me his uh, herd of Californians and they were all, hard as a rock but uh you know you're talking about a fur breed like mini rex or rex you know you start adding bone to it a lot of density they're just not going to feel like a californian or a new zealand you know they're not going to be rock hard so when you're saying that they have a thicker density they or i'm sorry a thicker bone they typically also have thicker density yes better density they'll also have thicker ears and a better mm-hmm. head shape. Yeah, so, better head shape is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, and that's one of the a very distinct factor, especially in Joe's barn, is he's got those big, massive heads. But if you look at the rest of the rabbit, it's got the thick ears, it's got insane bone, it's got amazing density. So it 
it all it all really connects. It, these are these are, I mean, there's five points on head, five points on ears. I want to take the points wherever I can get them. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> ten points right there. You know, uh, if you can get an extra ten points based uh, just using you know better bone rabbits, I think it's worth it to to try to suck up those points. Absolutely. Well, and, and for the health of the animal too, like those ones that have the more massive bone, they carry their weight better. They yeah. end up doing better in their cages. They they just naturally produce better. They yep. have the flush condition. And Dave, David, let me tell you the one thing that I don't have in my herd. I don't have sore hocks or thin foot pads. And I Which attribute that to, yeah. Mm -hmm. Th that's, what I, that's what I mean though, is that like, that's oh, a, yeah. it's a positive health trait that then gives you it's just a, a healthier animal. So you are already ahead of the curve. You have better fertility or better uh, uh, health to produce the next generation. David, yeah. I have that are going overweight. That's not necessarily great. <laughs> I'm not opposed to bigger mini racks. <laughs> I, I, like, I, big, I like bigger mini racks too. Thing. Big broody does are still positive. I still like them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make an eight month old mini Rex that can show a convention, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I understand. That's another they work, thing. They work well for producing. That's for sure. I think it's another thing that um, I definitely focus on. And I know Elise does too. We, we breed at similar times and for one reason, we want those seniors to be, you know, I like mine. Elise's I think are, they finish a little faster, probably like seven months or eight months. Um, I need a, more time like about eight months to nine months and they're finished and we know that about each other's herds you know mm -hmm. uh, so, uh you know you gotta you gotta like right now it is cold it's wet the rabbits don't want to breed but we got to get rabbits bred now like it's okay. like month, we got to get them bred in order to have seniors for convention mm -hmm. so a lot of people just you know they, they just don't have the motivation to go outside when it's 30 degrees outside and, and oh. it's cold but you gotta yeah, that's what sets you apart mm -hmm. it sets you apart big time that eight to ten month window for seniors you're you almost always win with seniors but that eight to ten month window is the prime time for sure especially for mini racks but being able to understand your herd and studying the litters and the babies you have like i've been saying is so important because all your lines are different like i'm gonna look at tigress i keep doing she was my best breed winner at convention this year um, 2022. And I, I want to be able to produce a rabbit that I know was when her prime time was. So I'm going to keep redoing that cross. And I know when I want it to be perfectly timed because I remember when she was finished, like you have to write these things down. You have to remember them. You have to know when their perfect breeding time was like my tort line out of Havoc. He won his first best in show at four and a half months. I can't do that with my other lines. Like my, my blacks, my brokens, my otters, um, my torts finish a lot quicker. Um, structure and fur wise too so like i said you just really need to know your lines yeah and it's you know even the fur we talk about how the body changes um the 2021 convention though uh y52 she had a really great short coat you know dan she was good you know she's got one of the best coats joe don't don't play it <laughs> I saw that rabbit yeah. at convention for the first time and I looked at Joe and I said, she's winning best of breed. And that was on the first day. And then she ended up winning best of breed. It was freaking Lisa. awesome. So. But no, no, but let me tell you something. When she was like five, six months old, her coat wasn't that great. Mm -hmm. She did not have that sort of density. You know, I showed her at eight and a half months and she grew into that buttery texture mm -hmm. and mm -hmm that in that density and that's why i think that you know you gotta understand you, you know i have that young doe at home i was just gonna say that joe I have, I have even that. her babies are the same way they don't yeah. quite have that cult yet but that's yeah. what makes it interesting because you are very hopeful knowing how the mom that's produces right. that it's gonna be the same way and that's why she's in your number one spot in your barn yeah yeah a couple weeks ago <laughs> my rabbits last week and I have them lined up, you know, one, two, three, four, my, my favorite ones. And there's this odd rabbit that's in the number one hole, but it's not nearly as good as number two or three. But mm -hmm. the thing is, I kind of know what her mother was like, right? And I'm hoping she's going to turn out like her mother. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's why she's my hopeful in the number one right. hole. But again, she's very similar to how the mom was at a, that age as that's well, right. too. So. Mm -hmm. 
being able to understand that is so important and sets you apart from other breeders. You, you only gave her a nine. I did it at that current time, not what she's going to become. <laughs> we'll see. But it's, it's completely true, though. If, if you made that calling decision during that time, that you're like, eh, she's average, she's not special. You never even saw the opportunity. Right. Somebody may have had the best of breed winner in their barn. They just didn't know it. So they sold it or, you know. Oh, to or somebody else. Yeah. Joe, uh, what about, you want to talk about calling early? Uh. <laughs> I think Joe's probably called quite a few, quite a few ones in the beginning. He was call heavy and he learned he needs like to let them grow out a little bit. <laughs> like dealing with all these rabbits in, in my barn. I just, uh -huh. I called most of my rabbits, uh, but I like to have, I like to focus on, you know, certain, certain rabbits. Um, but uh, well, let's talk about breeding and what faults that we are willing to live with, you know, Ooh, in terms that's of a good topic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Joe, you go ahead and then I'll kind of. So, add in a lot of, you know, as I said, uh, rabbits that tend to be really deep, peak really far back, and, uh, you know, they'll have, you know, faults like they'll have a tendency to have a little bit of extra length in the shoulder. Uh, some of them will tend to be a little bit narrow at the base. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them will have a loin, a gap between the loin and the hip. Um, you know, little, little tendencies like this. Uh, people, there, a lot of breeders are like absolute, like nope. Yeah, sir, I'm gonna call it. Uh, uh, the biggest one I always hear people say is a, a narrow um, lower hindquarter, like the base. Like people call off that instantly. But this is kind of I don't know how you can really say this, but as the rabbit ages, they're gonna grow into that so much more. They might be super narrow when they're a baby, but as they get older and hit that eight to ten month window, they fill in so much with their hindquarter and their loin. Like that's one of the last things I look at unless they're super undercut as well as being narrow at the base. I, I think you just have, I think we all as, as exhibitors and breeders need to understand what the degree of that fault is. A severe, a severe, you know, long shoulder, narrow shoulder, they're going to be more, have a tendency of producing more of those. Slightly mm -hmm. longer on a brood though, that's, you know, super deep. You keep her for her attributes how deep she is over the hip, how full she is into the back end, how dense she is, for example. If she's got a fault, other people say, yeah, the back legs are a little bit too close together. I don't like the lack of fullness. Mm -hmm. Well, you better have a buck at home who's got a really wide set, you know, you know, uh, hind legs on him because you can fix those things. A lot of people are absolute colors, meaning like they'll say they'll focus on one trait, little pinch, call. Little, little long the shoulder, call. I think the most common fault that people call on are shoulders because it's the easiest one to see. Like yeah. any, 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 you know, anybody can understand what a long shoulder is, but how long of a shoulder are we talking about? If it's slightly long in the shoulder, I keep it. I breed with it. Not, mm -hmm. you know, preferably not a buck. My bucks are short shouldered, full in the hind quarter. They're just not as deep as my does are. Mm. Right. And that's why with, with that shoulder and length and shoulder, that's why it's so important to have a, not only that straight spine, but the steep spine. Yeah, correct. Why do you keep bucks like that, but those you want to be the other way? Well, my reason is, um, you know, I, I have plenty of short does here too, but uh, these longer does that peak, you know, a little further back, the, the ones I, the ones I have are, are, uh, or broody, as you say, the, the, the genetic normal ones, um, they'll give you a lot of babies. You'll get like six or seven in, yeah. uh, you know, in the litter. The longer ones tend to have, you know, more babies. And uh, I've kept longer does with, um, with different breeds and it's worked for me before. Mm. I also think it's a lot harder to get a good buck than a good doe. I don't know, just based on my experience. So even having better bucks and those really special unicorn boxes like key really. But like I said, you have to make them. It's hard to make. So like Joe said, with having those longer does um, at first that set them up for success um, to be able to create that correct top line. So, you know, I, uh, I got a picture you know the Sable Martin though that won uh, the 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 Dwarf Nationals this last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's a beautiful doe, right? Mm -hmm. Stunning, Friend, yeah. Super short body, super short ears on her. I got a picture of her mother. 
it was absolutely hideous. It was like it was like a mile long, flat. It looked pinched. Nothing great about her. And the breeder sent me the picture and just say, "This is her mother." Ha 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 ha. No, I, that's so true. Brie raises my sister raises dwarfs too, and her one of her best producing does was a doe that Cole Simons gave her. Um, it's a squirrel doe, but she is so big and broody and ugly. But she has been the most awesome producer. It's just crazy. Like, yeah, it's that's a really good point. Those ugly does will produce well. You know, that's why I, it's important so, to know your line because she does go to back to excellent lines. So I'm still in the camp that the more you keep breeding, you know, beautiful rabbits to beautiful rabbits, you're going to have more beautiful rabbits. And when you start, <laughs> breeding, you know, a lot of problems into your herd, mm -hmm. those problems start to pop up, you know, down the mm -hmm. road. I try not and it, to. And it'll make it a lot easier to call too. That's right. But it, but it is interesting that the like in that doe, I mean, she was stunning to look at, similar to what your guys' best of breed, you know, does are. That um, you just get those ones that are like, wow, <laughs> it's yeah. their it's their moment to make that yeah. time in the uh, legacy of the breed. Did, and did I don't you, know that dwarf. Uh, I just saw pictures of her. I did yeah. not. I didn't judge her. I heard from one of the judges, it's one of the top five best rabbits he's ever judged. Yeah. Like not of all breeds. He, he thought it was really amazing. And then I kind of looked at it. The picture looked really good in it. When I got a picture of the mother, it is not what I expected it to be. <laughs> I, she, she literally looked like, you know, half of a Himalayan body on her. And I could not believe that rabbit produced the, uh, the, the best of breed winner from the last dwarf national. So you never know. Right. Right. And that's why you, that's why you have your good ones, but you also have some of those wild cards too, which is, makes it more fun too. I think this dwarf gene has a tendency to do a lot of weird things too. Yes. yes but absolutely. Dwarf gene, you're going to get some weird things that happen, you know, but you, I mean, it's the breeder's job to figure out what it is, but yeah. David g gave me another idea. Um, I mean, I, I don't know about, I mean, Joe, we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but I don't know about you either, David. Like I, I, I kind of always, those big, like those special winners, like Tigris, um, Blacklist and Deja and Heartthrob for me and Stiletto, like they shined and had that glow when they were babies, like when they started jumping out of the nest box. I mean, you have some other good winners too, but those extreme special ones, like you can just tell. And that's just based on my experience. I don't know about you guys. Like I could just, I could just, I just had that feeling. Um, and it, sometimes it turns out, sometimes it doesn't, but it normally does for me. I try not to look at them now until eight weeks. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I have to look at them. There's this, oh. you just see that you look at, you look in the cage and you look at all the babies and you're like, which, I get a which one of you are going to be the good one. And you can point it out every, like for me, I can point it out and I, I just know it's, but it doesn't happen all the time. It's just those, those really, those really special ones you definitely can yeah, see. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it's only the true. really special ones. Yeah. 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 I mm -hmm. agree. I think eight weeks is where I need to start. Well, yeah, I, that's when you I, really, I, really actually know. But yeah. <laughs> eight, yeah, and I don't even have mine weaned at eight weeks sometimes either. So I think eight weeks is probably that's when I really start to actually pose them and look at them. But you kind of have like tigers. I have so many pictures of her as a baby. Like I, I just remember like she just had that look to her. Um, and I might not have posed her yet. Um, but yeah, eight weeks, I think is key as well, Joe, for me. Eight. Uh, okay, I, I admit it. Even I, six I, weeks. Yeah. I mean, we do look at them, but you don't actually ha know and you're not fully confident until maybe about eight weeks. At least I send each other pictures of six week old rabbits. We're guilty. Oh, yeah, all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's funny I, I mean that's when we're making those initial decisions as well is I mean, you, we feel that we understand what the, the line we, we feel that we're confident that we know how certain lines are going to develop and we start making those initial decisions then of knowing mm -hmm. which ones to, to keep and, and which ones not mm -hmm. when, you, when you look at him and say this looked like exactly like its mother or exactly like its father you know at this age you want to hang on to that rabbit if the mother or the father is pretty good, you know, mm -hmm. rabbit that looks like that. Yeah. Right. I mean, like that otter buck I have, um, the one that got chewed up. Yeah. Uh, but he's got that dead style body, you know. The, oh, but better, but better. 
puller in the hip. Uh, but when I looked at him yeah. and I said, guy looks like you that. You can tell he's out of debt, right? Like, like that's what's, that's another thing too, having that skill of being able to look at a rabbit and then knowing who it's out of, like, especially for herd buck wise, like I can look at Joe's rabbits and I'm like, Oh, that one out of DD. Is that one out of Mako? Is that one out of dead? And even for my herd as well, too. Um, like just being able to know how to do that is, is important because you can, you see those traits, you can pinpoint them and how consistent they produce. The, all the success in rabbits is based on what you keep and what you get rid of. I think, uh, you know, the culling is the ultimate art on, on how to, to most quickly improve your herd or make it go down. Yes, I agree. I do. Wish, I do wish, um, uh, you know, people were more, more open-minded. I think Facebook has a lot of positives that you can share with people, but at the same time, you know, you start seeing rabbits that don't look like yours and immediately people are very resistant and saying like, I don't like that style because it doesn't look like their rabbits. So, mm -hmm. Well, when in reality, didn't you know my rabbits didn't look like what I wanted them to look like when I started? You know, either they 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 evolved based on what I kept and you know what I uh, what I culled. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, this? You guys kind of brought this question on. Do you guys feel that you as breeders are managing a gene pool, and that's what's leading to success, or just specific rabbits and breeding them? I think uh, it's 90% the breeder and 10% the rabbits. Mm -hmm. So there's a saying that, um, how does the saying go? You know, you can give the best breeders, um, the, the best breeders will make winners out of calls. And while most people are taking winners and, you know, making calls out of them or something, I forgot how that saying goes. But, no, but that, I think that's one of the most important things too, Joe. I love that you guys say that. I mean, I, sometimes I'm like, I don't like you look at other people's herds and you're like, oh, I feel like that rabbit's being wasted. Like you as the breeder are what's in control. Your rabbits, like you could have, a like Joe said, a bunch of calls in front of you. Joe, Joe didn't start with ideal mini racks and he was able to make them into amazing mini racks. So being able to know how to do that and that art is sets and, you apart. And forever. what I've done just in the last um, two years She's raised mini Rex for a lot, a lot longer than two years, but she's made tremendous changes to her mini Rex to actually make them very, very good, really good. And so, you know, it's, you know, rabbits are not that hard to change. It's the, it's the breeder that's really hard to change. I mean, I, you know, you start getting resistance and, you know, from other breeders, especially like people have been in the, in, in the hobby for a long time. They don't want to, they don't want to, they you know, they don't want to make any changes to what they're winning at their local show. They want to keep breeding what they're, what, what they're winning best to breed with at their local show. You know, they don't, they, they, you know, I set the goal of, I want to have, you know, 30 holes of mini racks. And then I had them for a while and I said, these things are a pain in the ass, man. I just, they, they drove me crazy. And then I got obsessed with them and then all the tans left and then I had no tans left. And then, I have a whole bunch, you know, well, I had a few tans. Then the mini Rex and the tan switch barns. So originally it was like, you know, 100, 100 holes for tans, uh, 30 holes for uh, the mini Rex. And then all of a sudden I switched barns. There were 30 holes of tans and there was like 100 holes of uh, mini Rex. Yeah. And I got, I added another like 52 holes and they were all mini Rex. And then I realized it was time for the tans to go. Oh, hmm. Now there's only one, <laughs> one tan I left. At one <laughs> but that you actually pulled her out for me when I was there visiting last week. I mean, showing me tan color and her Rufus, like her color was insane. It was so perfect. So, yeah. I but know. Uh, another thing too, going off of like resistance and everything like that. And Joe said in the beginning as well, too, that like, we don't have secrets. We post everything. Joe's posted the recipe on Facebook and his blog, like the recipe is literally there for success for you to understand it. And that's why Joe and I like mentoring people so much, especially young people is they're so eager to learn and listen. Um, and I, I mean, mentorship is one of my favorite things about the hobby and all the youth I work with, but also adults too. Um, and there is a little bit more resistance with the um, people who've been doing it a while. Um, but it's cool to always see people trying to understand and maybe change their opinion a little bit as well too.
I, I agree. When I look at some of the younger breeders, like th they all seem to be young, you know, like Elise, mm -hmm. um, Elise is part of them. Zach Rolf, uh, satin guy. He's another one who raises, you know, fantastic rabbits, youth best. He bred the best in show, uh, Arva rabbit, uh, Arva best in show rabbit several years ago for a satin, uh, Ryan Smith raises great Californians, 18 year old kid. He knows great top line, how to breed for it. Uh, Faith Young, great mini lops. Another uh, one. Yeah. Faith Smith with the Rhinelander. Faith Smith with the Rhinelanders. Yep. I was just going to say that. Uh, Even, you know, I mean, Lewis and Noah are young too. Like, yeah, they're, they're the just killing it in so many breeds. Top spots and, you know, tans in the country. They're, mm -hmm. they, they also know what's up. Um, I Maddie just, and I just feel like these young people are evolving while a lot of the, uh, you know, older people my age are really, really stuck in their mindset of, you know, of what they want the rabbits to win. Because, you know, the same rabbit that won in, let's say, 2005 is not going to win in 2022. I have no idea what the 2005, you know, mini rucks look like, but I'm sure there's been a substantial improvement. We've you know. had that conversation many times, Joe, like has, has the quality changed? Or like have like you know what I mean? Explain that a little bit more. You're really good at explaining that. Uh, Elise and I want to make sure that another not want to make sure that an average mini rex never wins another ARBA convention. <laughs> well, that's blood, but yeah, <laughs> we want it so to be. Like like that rabbit that won 10 years ago, best of breed mini arcs, like, is it as good as what they are now? Like what's changed? Are I, people's mindsets changing? Are the rabbits changing? Like, have they changed that much? They, I always think about like, how, what did they look like then? I would they, say, I mean, I, I can say I would, it. I mean, we, I mean, I would like looking at it, like looking at that breed specifically, the, the fur progression has drastically yeah, like, changed. Just, I mean, absolutely the, the density and the buttery texture and the, and the, the plushness to the coat is so incredibly more and just so much density now than what it was in the 2000s. I mean, in the 2000s, it was deep, thick bodies. I still think that they had good type, but not as deep as what you guys have made them now. Um, but they, they, let me ask you a question. This is before my time with Mini Rex. Yeah. Cast, casters used to win a lot. Oh, yeah, this is a good one. Yeah, we yeah. always talk about this. So, you know, I talk thought sandy lowry about this i said sandy you raised casters whites brokens blacks everything for many many years did the density get better on the brokens or did the uh density get did the coats get worse on the casters and she yeah. said the, the first definitely gotten better on the uh blacks and brokens and and otters they did on the uh casters and they got left behind because from what i remember when i had uh tans these casters used to win all the time, you know, mm -hmm. and now when you, I, I mean, I haven't seen a lot of casters, but the casters, you know, they're, they're just not able to quite mm -hmm. compete with brokens or even, mm -hmm. even like the, uh, even like the otters, for example. Yeah. Otters have really been up and coming. I mean, my sister won best of breed uh, youth mini racks in 2007 and 2008 uh, with casters. Uh -huh. And they, they were absolutely incredible animals, deep bodied, super thick, amazing coats. I mean, just, I still remember the fur on the, the doe, the, the one in 07 and in 08, just absolutely incredible in their moment in time. Like, yeah, they yeah, were yeah. So in the breed. Um, but, but genuinely, care? but genuinely, like the casters one in the early 2000s, they were just super slick. And they had the texture and density somehow somebody or somehow like collectively as a breed um the breeders have found that density trait and that that resistance and just a little bit longer coat i feel it's longer than what it used to be yeah, um, yeah. and that's where that's the divide casters haven't uh kept up with it i feel um, like the caster coat is like really short in black density yes, yes. correct Mm -hmm. it's 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 more like i mean you've been to you've been they're just a lot years. shorter yeah and cold it, in my opinion been, I'm, not, I'm not ragging on casters i just haven't bred them uh mm -hmm. it's, it's a color that i would never raise mm -hmm. for reason. not because i don't like it i don't have good good enough mm -hmm. vision to see all the bands you know the color bands so that's one of the reasons why i yeah. you know, 
why I've color it. colors yeah color is important but it's the same amount of points on every other mini arcs color as well too and i mean cole, cole and i won opposite of breed with that caster buck this year um and he had one of the most amazing coats ever uh but he was out of my otter buck blacklist who has an excellent coat and produces excellent coats so cole cole and i cole simons and i our goal is to improve them in their bodies and their coats um because obviously that's kind of dwindled as a kid i remember everyone had casters casters were always winning and i never did them um and then cole and i were like oh what if we what if we raise casters and he loves agoutis and i love mini rex so we're like okay let's do that and i mean our our absolute breed winner didn't have perfect color but his body and coat were so extreme that he just kind of glowed and i think that's that's our goal is improving casters completely i don't, I don't think when I don't want that color problem. I don't <laughs> exactly. I don't, color sucks, but it's the same amount of points in every color of mini rex. I don't think that like the color modifiers when people breed in an otter or a, a black that they typically have the right rufus factors right, right. To, to make it successful. And then it's this off, like it, it's just this not pretty color. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. And then you don't have the density mm -hmm. there. So there, there hasn't been as much interest in it. Right. But the, the other thing I was going to say was that like the the breeders from like the UK, like that Rex coat. Yeah. Is I, I would I would argue that that's more of like what we had in the two thousands. It's a much shorter, mm -hmm. extremely slick, um, yeah. nice texture David, coat. David, uh, when we're when you are when you and I are both out in Bradford together, uh, you know, you obviously judge judge the group out there for the uh, U.S. show. Did you feel the uh, the coats on the um, the 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 Rex and the yeah. and that's they don't have the density that we have here, but they have like super texture and super finish. Have you noticed that? And then there, aren't there col isn't their color like amazing? Their bands and everything. If it's an agree. Right. And oh, right. But that's what I'm saying is the difference between like the 2000s of what Minirex fur felt like then, um, yeah. and that we've evolved to this an extremely dense coat um, versus what theirs is. Theirs is a much shorter hair shaft. Right. Uh, that's interesting. So but I agree, Joe, a lot of casters do have that shorter hair shaft and aren't quite as dense. The ones I have I've, to, Yeah, I, I, most of them are. And they do have that, they all have kind of that similar texture just because their hair, like their hair, each hair follicle is a little bit thinner too. Gotcha. But that's just knowing colors and, and, and mini Rex and everything too. And any breed that they, they all, they all differ. But the fun part with working on color projects is making them as equal as the blacks, the brokens and the otters. So um, kudos to the people that do focus on those rare colors. I don't have the time. I don't have the space. I have the time for it. I just don't have the space or the motivation for any more colors than I have. I don't, I don't like the dilutes. I like the blacks. I like black otters, uh, broken blacks and black. And that's all I want to stick with. I don't want, I don't want blues, lilac, chocolate, mm -hmm. you know, whatever else is out there. And I, don't, that, I love the challenge of working on other projects, but in the last couple, like the last year or so, I kind of sat down and looked at my herd. And I'm like, oh, this is fun having all these colors, but like, what are the ones that are winning? Do I want to win best of breed at a convention of nationals? Then I probably need to cut these colors and focus on the ones and save more holes for the ones that do. Dump their sables. Sable smokes, seals, chocolates, lilacs, they all, they all, all went bye-bye. <laughs> so... I mean, it's fun to win a variety or a group at, at convention and nationals, but I mean, they don't often win breed, but that's why I still have my torts. They're my fun project. Very cool. No, and your torts are still awesome. I, I, <laughs> I truly feel that way. I, I, honestly thought that was, I honestly thought I was picking a tort there in Wisconsin. I, I, uh, and yeah. I was like, my God, this thing's amazing. And then I was like, no, nope, not anymore. We're All close. Right. He was, yeah. You picked, the, you picked the broken buck. Yeah. Yeah. Atomic. Yeah. Yep. Atomic and then Tigris. But yeah, you were thinking about Flaming Hot Cheeto, that tort buck. But then he was the one that won one opposite a group. So that was cool. Yeah. This has been really cool. I, I can't think of anything else. Um, thank you guys so much for doing this. Um, Our this pleasure. Thanks for having us. I was super honored that that you asked us and um it's been fun this was literally just a conversation between breeders and um i hope some other breeders can learn from it and enjoy watching it as well i hope people can un un understand get to better understand the mindset of uh mm -hmm. who Sullivan is and who joe kim is 
by, you know, by watching this, not looking at us as, you know, these people that are just out to win all the time. We have, there's so much preparation and you know, sometimes you run into a jam, like you can't make up a decision. I call Elise, Elise calls me, like, I don't know what to do with this one. Grow yeah. it out. Love your people you go to for sure. Yeah. But we ultimately, we just like to have fun. Like, this is fun for us. This is my getaway from the real world. Like, I can talk rabbits all day. <laughs> all day. <laughs> someone in that understands that is like-minded and um, is working towards the same goals is one of the biggest things. So I think even ending, ending the presentation really by saying connections and relationships are so important in this hobby, whether you think so or not. Or to people that are, that want to watch you succeed and are Mm -hmm. not going to, and you know, they, 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 they want it. They want, they want, they do have your best interests at heart too. Mm -hmm. It's very Mm -hmm. important. And if you, if you want that good top line, if you want to improve your rabbits, I mean, reality check, you're going to have to do it yourself. You're not going to be able to just buy animals that have those perfect top lines. Joe and I are trying to do that ourselves. Like we might only have a few that we think might be perfect, but um, in other eyes, they might be, there might be more to other people, but you have to you, be able to understand the structure of the rat, each rabbit and um, be able to make it on your own. Um, but we can, you can buy those parts, but you have to put it together. And that's what, like Joe said, makes this hobby as great as it is. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. It's been really neat. Okay, Thanks, David. Evening, okay. Thank you guys. We'll see you. Bye. See ya.